In this video, I will present maximum a posteriori image reconstruction, also known as regularized image reconstruction or Bayesian image reconstruction. And it's all about dealing with the problem of noise. So in this slide, I'm showing the artificial case of noise-free measured data coming from an object inside a PET scanner field of view. And what we're seeking to do is reconstruct um, an image theta that uh, corresponds to the measured data. Now, if we were to do a maximum likelihood reconstruction after 32 iterations, if there's no noise in the data, we would have quite a good quality image and we would carry on iterating until a very high number of iterations because there's no noise. However, in reality, due to limited PET scanner sensitivity, due to limited scan time, limited injected radiation dose, we have, of course, Poisson distributed noisy measured data. So 32 iterations from noisy data gives quite a poorer quality image compared to that uh, noise-free case shown to the left there. And of course, the more noise that's present, the worse the image gets due to even shorter scan times, for example. And so there is a need to compensate for noise, and we call this compensation process regularization. And in this video, I'm going to be focusing on the maximum a posteriori method for image reconstruction. So, as mentioned, maximum likelihood estimates can be noisy, depending on the parameters that have been chosen to be estimated. But we can, however, use our prior knowledge about what we expect those images to look like, and by using that prior knowledge, we can reduce noise. This is done via the following kind of Gibbs prior, where we talk about the probability of a given image theta. And we do that by devising some energy function u, which gives a high value if the input image is something that we consider that we do not want, such as a very noisy image. Or if the image theta is an image that we think is good and that corresponds to our expectations, then that would deliver a small value of u because a small value of the energy u would give rise to a high probability, whereas if theta is, for example, a noisy image, that gives rise to a large value of the energy u, which results in a small probability. And then what we're going to do is include this prior probability with the Poisson likelihood to get our maximum a posteriori objective function and seek, therefore, to maximize that objective whilst accounting for our prior probabilities of what the images should look like. So let's take an example of how that energy function u could be defined. So here I have an example PET image, and I'm looking here at a particular pixel index j, and the image value is theta. Then what we can do is consider other pixels in the neighborhood, and I'm going to label those other pixels with a with an index C, and we've got a value theta C for these other pixels. Now, what we can do is say that if those pixels are different, we can say that corresponds to a high energy because they would be different, for example, due to a lot of noise present. However, of course, um, we're only going to impose that if they are a certain distance, because if they're too far away from each other, then we can allow them to be different without any concern because they're probably in different structures. Now, we do not want positive and negative differences to have um, a kind of a different effect in the definition of our energy. And so what we do is define a potential function of those differences. So a quadratic, for example, would account for the positives and negatives in the same way, as would an absolute value. And when we use this potential function as the absolute function, we get what is called total variation. But there are many possible potential functions of these intensity differences that can be used. For example, a Huber prior uh, would use the combination of a quadratic with the absolute function. Now, we can also, as kind of implied before, build in a distance measure. So, for, for example, the further this uh, pixel C is from pixel J, we can use a smaller weighting factor for that potential. And that would mean that if those pixels are very different, then if they're far apart, then they won't have much contribution to the energy, which is basically saying we are okay with that because it's only high energy that we're wanting to avoid in our reconstruction. So that accommodates uh, different uh, pixels in different regions. So for example, if they're very close, then we imagine they are in the same region, and so therefore 
uh, with close distance, we're going to require this potential function to be low, to deliver a low energy. We're looking for a theta that satisfies a small value of this potential. Furthermore, then, we're going to consider all of the pixels in this neighborhood. So in other words, this pixel J gets compared with all the other pixels C that are members of the neighborhood within that red square. And then we do that same process for every single centered pixel over the entire image. Now, we can even take this a bit further. So here I'm showing now the case of guidance weights W. So we could have, for example, uh, an MR image or even the current PET image estimate from which we can estimate what these guidance weights should be. So I'll give you the illustration for the case of an MR patch. This doesn't correspond to the patch shown in the PET image here, but you should be able to understand the concept. So imagine um, this is um, centered on the same region as the PET image then what we can do is come up with this set of values first of all, which just looks at the square difference between the values in the MR image, for example, T1 weighted image. And you can see here along this diagonal, for example, um, the difference between the pixels is actually quite small. So this square difference map here, we have dark or zero values. Whereas in this direction, these pixels are different to that center pixel. And so we have brighter values. Then what we can do is take the negative of this, then the exponential, to end up effectively using a Gaussian kernel to deliver a similarity map like I'm showing just on the right-hand side here. And what that will do is deliver a set of weights that can control our potential function which operates on these differences. So for example, along this diagonal here, the weights are all more or less one, which means we're going to be switching on or keeping that potential, that energy function will be active along that diagonal, meaning that we care about um, how different the pixels are in the PET image. It's going to, this energy function is going to favor PET images that have similar values along that diagonal because the MR image has similar values along that diagonal. Whereas in this direction, um, the weights will be switched off and actually allow different PET intensities across that edge. So this is effectively an edge-preserving set of guidance weights that modify the potential function. One more thing to note here is that a popular method is called the Bauscher method, where these weights are defined to be either one or zero. And then the key parameter there is to decide how many uh, weights to have, how many values of one to have in the similarity map. And so a very large value would effectively switch off the edge preservation because we'd be allowing smoothing between multiple neighbors. Whereas if we have a limited number of ones present in that similarity map, then those ones would only be in particular structural regions uh, because we're just looking for like the K nearest neighbors, if you like. And so that Bauscher is like a, a binary version of that weighted smoothing method that I just mentioned. Okay, so now let's look at how we're going to incorporate those energy functions, which of course give those prior probabilities, how we're going to incorporate those into our maximum likelihood reconstruction to turn it into a maximum a posteriori reconstruction. So first of all, let's quickly revise Poisson likelihood for complete data Z. Now remember the complete data Z corresponds to the case of having a complete set of sinogram data for each and every pixel or voxel. This would make our reconstruction extremely simple, as we'll rapidly review on this slide. So what we have here then is for complete data Z, that very straightforward data set that facilitates reconstruction, we just use the Poisson probability uh, with mean given by a, a component of the system model A um, with the image estimate theta B, and this models the mean value of the complete data element Zib. So the mean value is just this minus, or rather the mean is just Aib theta b. That's the mean of Zib. Just the Poisson probability with the mean defined as I've shown. And of course, we need to consider this Poisson likelihood for every single projection uh, element i and for every single pixel uh, indexed by b here. Then what we do is take the Poisson log likelihood for the complete data. So these products become summations, the exponential disappears, 
and this just simply works through as follows by taking as as shown by taking the logarithm and then of course to maximize the poisson complete data log likelihood we're going to take the partial derivative with respect to a pixel value and so what we see here is that for a particular pixel value theta j j just corresponds to one of the uh, indices present within that summation over all the pixels b in that sum so we're only interested in one of them and so when we hit b is equal to j we get a coefficient a i j there's a minus there as well so that explains this result and then here we have a z i j again because we're looking for pixel j um, divided by a i j theta j that's just the derivative of um, so it's one over a i j theta j the derivative of the log multiplied of course by a i j and then this final term is a constant so that's how we get that expression there we want to maximize it so we set it equal to zero and then we mark the, the theta that is going to fulfill that equation as the maximum likelihood estimate of the pixel value theta and so just by very simple rearrangement of this expression we can get this very simple expression which says that the maximum likelihood estimate for a pixel corresponds to taking the complete data associated with a single pixel j sum up all the data within that complete data um, for that given pixel j and then do a sensitivity um, normalization this is just the well-known a transpose one sensitivity image often used in mlem reconstruction now of course in reality we do not have complete data and so that's why we use the expectation maximization method where what we do instead is put in a kind of conditional expectation of the complete data z because we don't actually have it and we derive that conditional expectation of z based on knowledge of m which is fixed that's the measured sinogram data and based on a current estimate of the object representation parameters theta k in other words the reconstructed image a current estimate that will give us a, a current z okay let's build in now that prior probability um, based on that energy function that we've already gone over now along with beta which is the hyperparameter which controls the regularization strength it's going to control how much attention we pay to that prior probability obviously if beta is equal to zero effectively that switch off switches off the prior entirely but when we've got it combined like this we are now dealing with what is called the posterior probability and in this case still for the complete data z so again it's the product over all the bins and all the pixels uh, we take the log of that and here i'm saying this is the objective function for the complete data for maximum a posteriori estimation of theta given measured data m so when we take the log the products go to summations um, the z of course comes down the front of the log here exponential disappears and then we've got a constant term that i've eliminated from this because it won't affect the location of the max of the theta that maximizes this expression and then of course that final uh, prior here just goes merely to minus beta times the energy function so we can rearrange that by placing the sigma i within this, these brackets here you'll see why i'm doing that in a moment on the next slide and then also note here that i have now substituted explicitly for the conditional expectation of the complete data based on our current image estimate theta k and based also on the measured data vector m okay so that's the same expression as the one we just saw on the previous slide we're now going to manipulate that a bit more first thing we'll do is look at that logarithm term and recognize that a product here can be split to log aib plus log theta b so i've kept the log theta b here the log aib is just a constant and that's multiplied by complete data which is also a constant for the purposes of trying to find the theta that maximizes this expression because theta k here is fixed and m is fixed and so the complete data are fixed and so all of that comes out as a constant um, so that splits up the logarithm as shown and then here we recognize that as the sensitivity image but first of all i'll just factor it out here to the left hand side and because I'm factoring it out, I need to put it in the denominator here of that complete data component. And now, um, hopefully, you'll see why we've done that rearranging. First of all, then, as mentioned, sigma i a i b, that's none other than the sensitivity image. That's just a transpose one, the back projection of unit data. 
Now this expression here, you should recognize that as the solution to the complete data um, log likelihood problem. And um, that's none other than the EM update when we have a conditional expectation of the complete data, Z. So in other words, this is just the regular MLEM update that's very easy to obtain just by forward projection ratio, back project, and multiply. Um, and then finally, we have, of course, the logarithm and the minus theta term here as well. So what we end up with here in this complete data map objective function is purely an image space optimization. We just want to find the theta that maximizes that expression. And it's worth noting that if beta was zero, then the theta that maximizes this is none other than theta EM. We'd just be back to the MLEM update, which is very reassuring. That is what we'd want to have if we set our regularization strength beta equal to zero. But of course, we want to build in the penalty to stop theta from becoming too noisy. And it would only become too noisy if it fits theta EM, that noisy image that we get with maximum likelihood estimation. It would only get too noisy if theta fits theta em. And so that's why we want that penalty to prohibit that overfitting to the data. Okay, so that's the same expression at the top of the slide. We're now going to maximize that. So we're going to take the partial derivative with respect to a pixel value. Um, so that's this expression here, theta em, log theta it just goes to one over theta. Theta b is just simply one after the partial derivative. And then finally, we're showing the partial derivative of the energy function with respect to a pixel value. So hopefully that expression is quite straightforward, pointing out, of course, that theta j is referring to one single pixel value out of the entire summation here. So that's why that summation disappears, because j is just one of the elements there. Then to find the maximum, what we do, of course, is set that equal to zero. And the theta that fulfills that equation is going to be our next estimate. And the reason for that, of course, is that um, we are only operating on a current estimate of the complete data, strictly speaking, the conditional expectation of the complete data, because we don't actually have complete data. So for that reason, setting that to zero and solving will only give us a next better, next best estimate heading towards the maximum a posteriori estimate of theta. So otherwise, I hope the rest of that expression is quite clear. Just to point out again that by setting it equal to zero, any appearance of theta is now marked as theta k plus one. So that's why that expression is now in terms of theta k plus one and then the other terms as before. So that's the equation we need to solve. First of all, then, uh, we'll look at a, a method that was popular over many years called the one step late method proposed by Green back in 1990. And it uses an approximation because that partial derivative of the energy with respect to the theta k plus one is actually very difficult to find because theta k plus one is what we actually want. So it already appears here in the equation. So what happens with the one step late method is that they plug in the previous or the current estimate of theta to calculate that derivative of the energy. And then you can rearrange that expression quite simply to solve for the next estimate, theta k plus 1. It's just given by a combination of the EM update along with the derivative of that energy function evaluated at your current estimate. So when you spell it all out, you get a very recognizable expression. This is just the regular MLEM update with a modification in the denominator here. So we've got the familiar forward projection, ratio, back project, multiply, sensitivity image, but then we've got this offset where we've got beta times the gradient of the energy evaluated at the current estimate. And so that can be a problem. Um, this method is not guaranteed to converge. You could have negatives in the denominator if you're not careful here. And so this method is not really recommended, but can be a good starting point for working with map reconstruction. So this method here is far more robust, but it's a bit more limited. Although ironically, as it turns out, this is now a method that is really being used a lot in deep learning based reconstruction, which we'll get to in other videos. But for now, this was actually a, a simple method proposed way back in 1987 by Leviton and Herman, 
where all you do for your energy function is say, well, I want my map estimate theta to not be too far from some prior image that I have. Now, of course, where do you get that prior image from is the key question, and we'll, we'll deal with that in other videos. But for here, um, for now, we'll, we'll assume we've just got some prior image just to understand example two. So, working this through with just such a simple expression for the energy function, we can e easily take the partial derivative, and we see that this quadratic um, and the summation just goes to a very simplistic expression because, of course, it's only the partial derivative with respect to a single pixel value theta j. So because of the simplicity of that, we do not need that one step late approximation. So this expression looks very much like what we were dealing with before, but now we've substituted in explicitly uh, for the partial derivative of u, evaluated crucially at the estimate that we need to find theta k plus 1. So we can rearrange that as follows. Here I've just multiplied by theta k plus 1. The reason for doing that is that we can now put it in the form of a standard quadratic equation. And so if you like, this is like ax squared plus bx plus c, which means we can use our very simple standard quadratic solution formula. And when we do that, we can solve for theta k plus 1 and we find the following expression which is actually quite straightforward to understand. Really, it's saying the update is given by the prior image P. Remember that appeared as the prior at the top there, um, in combination with the EM update image. These other factors are simple to understand. W is just a weighting factor in case we wanted that, but really you can set that equal to one here. Beta is the strength of regularization and S is the sensitivity image. So really, this is just a, a very, um, kind of particular combination of the prior image and the EM update that are combined in such a way as to pay attention to that prior as well as pay attention to the data as well. And that's how we get our next update. However, the problem with that expression is that you, if you set beta equal to zero, you, you get a very bad solution. It blows up um, completely. So here, what we do is use the Muller's solution of a standard quadratic form. And that's just an alternative expression for finding the solutions to a quadratic. And this way, we can get this expression, which is, should give equivalent results to the other one, except that now, when beta equals zero, we nicely get an update which corresponds to the MLEM update, which is exactly what we want um, if beta is zero. We'd want the map method to just uh, go back to regular MLEM. And so that's exactly what we get with this expression. So this is the one that often I personally would use if I'm using that prior image formulation. Okay, a third example is a bit more advanced. This was by De Piero in 1995. This does not need a prior image. And so it only operates on the current theta that you're dealing with, that you're trying to find. And it, it does an assessment on it in a very similar fashion to what we were looking at much earlier on in this video with the definition of that energy function u, where we had a potential function psi. Here it's a quadratic looking at a pair of pixel values. And it includes those weighting factors that we talked about, which could account for the distance, as well as also a guide image if we have it in the form of an MR, for example, or self-guided PET. So that's a more general expression for the energy function, which feeds into that prior probability. And it was De Piero who found a, a very clever way of building that into the map um, framework and came up with the following expression in effect. Um, and it's very similar to what we saw on the previous slide, except instead of using some prior image, we use a smoothed update of the current estimate. And that, amazingly, is what will actually take into account that quadratic, that weighted quadratic prior for use um, in the map objective. And so all you do here is take your current image, theta k. You can see this is like a, a, a weighted combination of neighbors. It's just like a, a smoothing term here, except there is this additional um, component here. In fact, you take the center pixel plus the neighboring pixels L um, in combination for all of those weights. And so that's why it's not quite as simple as a convolution is, but it's very similar to a convolution. 
or indeed actually it depends on your choice of weights which can be very spatially variant so this can in fact be very different to some kind of convolution smooth. Um, and so anyway, um, by using that expression correctly with guided weights with a quadratic prior as shown here, then you get this update expression, which is just a weighted combination of the data-based EM update with a smoothed version of your current image estimate, theta k. And it is worth noting the similarity to the previous formulations for the prior image, that if you were to configure this such that the sum of the weights is equal to 1, and if you were to set the prior image equal to theta sm, then you would actually get the same process as described in the previous two examples, the same update formula. So I'll give you one more example, um, because this one, a bit like the example 2 case, um, suddenly really comes in when we're going to look ahead to deep learning based methods and building them into PET image reconstruction. So here we want to exploit a generic denoising method, for example, a convolutional neural network, median filter, Gaussian filter, whatever your favorite smoothing filter might be. Although for that, we don't know how to define the energy function u. But what we can do instead is define what we would like the update to look at, look like. So that we can regard this, in other words, take your current estimate of the image theta k, do your denoising operator on it and get a smoothed update. We're going to regard that as a gradient based update according to some unknown prior, some unknown energy function. So if we do that, we can plug it in um, in a similar fashion to what we've seen in the previous slides for the other MAPEM examples, where we have a smoothed update, theta sm, in combination with the EM update image. And so again, it's a fusion of the EM update along with a denoised version of the current image estimate theta k. And what that's doing is effectively this proximal operator here, where we're finding the theta that maximizes the Poisson log likelihood, but with a penalty term saying that theta must not go too far from the denoised current, up, current estimate of the image. So that effectively is what this is doing. So to give an example now for the case of just a weighted quadratic penalty, so psi here is just a quadratic, uh, looking at neighboring values, right back to those early slides we looked at. Um, psi is the distance weighting, and W is going to be based on Bauscher weights, either 1 or 0, based on similarity of pixels within an MR image. So if we do that, if we choose a large number of uh, ones in the weighting uh, map there, for example, 90, that means we're going to allow a lot of uh, pixels to be smoothed across. And so for that reason, this almost looks like a regular quadratic penalized map EM reconstruction. But as we reduce the number of values of one that are in that um, set of weights W, as we reduce them, so those weights take on the shape of similarities, if you like, of K nearest neighbors of MR patches within the MR image. And that limits this smoothing to be constrained within those similar regions of the MR image, but does that smoothing within the PET image. So just to emphasize, these are, of course, PET reconstructions, but heavily guided by the Bauscher weights, which were derived from the T1 weighted MR. So that's all I wanted to say on map reconstruction. Thank you for listening.